You're listening to the Talking Hidways Podcast Network. Talking Mondays. Talking Mondays. Happy Monday. This is Mondays at the Overhead Wire, sponsored by our generous Patreon supporters. I'm Jeff Wood, your host, and joined by Han Solo. That's right. Our favorite Wookiee's right-hand man is here to keep us hydrated. I've got some Canton in a glass with Han Solo. So it's just me this week. Just wanted to get back into the groove. We took a couple of weeks off to relax and (laughs) recover from um, just working generally, and uh, we're back and we're in session. So I hope everybody's doing well and and kind of keeping it together. I know that it can be hard these days with the pandemic still out there kind of looming uh, as people get sick and worried. And, um, you know, things are things are continuing to happen, goes up up and down on all the charts in terms of infections and things like that. But um, I know that I know that there's a bit of opening up in a lot of places and people are going out. I'm still a bit nervous about it. But I know that there are folks that are that are getting out there, and and hopefully everybody stays safe. And then there's also this this war of aggression from Russia in Ukraine going on, which is frustrating. You know, covering the news, it's frustrating. A lot of days, we do the newsletter every day. We go through a lot of news articles, and so when you're talking about urban places and cities and transportation and all those things, now a lot of stuff comes up um, about war, which is sad, frustrating a little bit annoying uh, from a from a from uh, just a perspective that it's happening uh, because I'd rather it not be, but I don't have control over that stuff. It just does. But there's, there's also a lot of great things to talk about as well, including what we have coming up on the podcast, on the Talking Headways podcast, which is really exciting. Uh, first off, we had a nice conversation for part one with Jeremy Levine about his book, Constructing Community. Part two is coming out this week, and if you haven't listened to the episode, please do. Uh, of course, read the book if you haven't, because there's a lot of amazing stuff in there, but definitely find some way to consume the information, because seriously, this is one of the best books I've read this, thus far, talking about how the little p politics of development and transportation actually takes place in cities. The factions, the petty fights, the power struggles, <laughs> it's all in there, and will give you a new perspective than you had perhaps before. So check it out on Talking Headways, or get the book. Also coming up soon. We've got Kevin Krizik and, and David King. They chatted me with me about their book, uh, Advanced Transportation Planning, which was a great and wonderful conversation. That show will likely be out on the Thursday after this Thursday, which is when the um, Constructing Community piece comes out. And uh, then we're chatting uh, on Thursday, hopefully, with Jenny Schutz of Brookings about her book, Fixer Upper. I hope that that's an interesting conversation about housing and, and what's going on around the country related to that and her thoughts on it. It'll be interesting to see. I also have a stack of books waiting to be read uh, and set up times for recording. I have Alex and Alex uh, soon to come on to talk about their papers on transport and security as well. So it's going to be a wonderful couple of weeks, a wonderful month of uh, Talking Headways podcast. And I'm so glad to share that with everybody. A huge slate of new content. Uh, I'm so glad we get to share these conversations. And I really appreciate that you guys come back and listen to Talking Headways each week and, and bi-weekly for, or bi-monthly for, for sometimes for the Monday show. So, uh, you know, I also heard back from you on a few show suggestions too, uh, some from folks. So uh, some really good ones that I'll try to work on. Um, but we will try to get, say, for example, like a, a Canada transit show. That sounds like uh, something that we really would would love doing and trying to talk to to folks about that the difference between say Canada uh, Canadian I should say and uh, American transit sounds like fun also uh, because we cover all these books that we've talked about on the show and, and as I mentioned last time we partnered with bookshop.org as an affiliate so this means that if you buy a book through the overhead wire shop on bookshop a small amount of that purchase goes to us now we love when you order from your local bookstores but if you want to support the authors we have on and help us keep interviewing them that would be tremendous all the books we've ever discussed are on the show with the authors uh, and they're now in the shop so bookshop.org slash shop slash the overhead wire that's bookshop.org slash shop slash shop slash the overhead wired man hey i need to drink this drink okay and finally, I have an extra copy of Peter Norton's Autonorama. Uh, we talked with Peter about the book recently on the show, so if you want to read it, uh, we might be able to help you out. 
If you leave a review on iTunes or a tweet post on the link, LinkedIn page about it, uh, about the show, I'll put names in a hat and then we'll send it for free to the person who wins. Uh, but make sure to tag me on Twitter at The Orbit Wire and I'll be checking the reviews on iTunes as well. It helps us to get discovered when people are browsing for shows. This is the last week we'll be looking for entries and we have several so far. So make sure that you get your name in the hat so that we can send Peter's book to somebody that's deserving. Um, thanks so much for folks who have been tweeting about the show. Also, uh, hopefully we can send the book out soon. So looking forward to that as well. Before we get to the show, I want to let folks know that they can get this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, and of course, Apple Podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And subscribing means you get both Mondays at the Orbit Wire and Talking Headways on the same feed. Two fun podcasts, one great channel. Thanks to the folks who subscribe as well through Podcatchers. We really appreciate you guys coming back each week to the show. And it's awesome that you can keep coming back and listening to us talk about this fun urban transportation and urban planning stuff. Um, I like talking about it. I'm glad you all <laughs> appreciate listening to it from time to time. Okay, let's get to the news. Here are a few stories that piqued our interest from the newsletter of the last few weeks. These are items that were popular on the Orbit Wire daily. Usually I collect 1,500 news items a day, and I pull out the 30 or so that I think are most interesting for my readers. Uh, at the, for the newsletter, we have a free newsletter and we have a paid newsletter. Um, folks can sign up for a free trial of the paid newsletter by going to theoverheadwire.com. But these are the ones that are the most read by both groups. And uh, I think it's pretty exciting because then we kind of get an idea of what people are really interested in and what they want to hear about. So that's pretty cool. A couple of weeks ago, there was an article in The Atlantic uh, about Phil Bokovoy, who is a uh, an activist in Berkeley. I know that uh, a lot of folks call him a NIMBY. I, th- I, I, said, I guess I would subscribe to that. Um, but there was an article in The Atlantic called The NIMBY King uh, about him. And I'm not going to talk too much about the sequel. It was a really popular article. That's why I'm mentioning it. But I'm not going to talk too much about it because I do want to note that I do want to note that the process is broken. But also Give Me Shelter, which is the California Housing Podcast, and they did a really, really good episode, and it would be kind of duplicative for us to do that as well. So if you get a chance, go over and listen to that show, uh, because they had a really good discussion with Jesse Argan of Berkeley, as well as Phil Bokvoy. And um, you know, my note on the subject is that, and, and this is the note that I'll always make about CEQA and, and, and housing in California, is that um, you know, according to some calculations, we're doing 4 million units uh, around the country. We're behind. Um, 60 Minutes Report on Sunday said that we haven't even built... Uh, this least less least amount of housing in in uh, the de- in in the last decade since we did in the 1960s, which basically means the 2010 to 2020 time period, we built so little housing that we haven't built that little housing since the 1960s, and our population at the time was about half what it is now. I think in 1960 it was like 180 million people, and now we're like 330 million people. So it's crazy to think about how much housing we have not produced in the last decade. Part of that was, I guess, because of the Great Recession, uh, but uh, but but a lot of that is because we just have these really bad zoning codes. We have a lot of uh, opposition, and I think we just need to build more housing. And for students, we need to build more housing. <laughs> we need to more build more housing in Berkeley, in San Francisco, and in, in Lafayette, and in all these places around the country. So uh, that's that's all I'll say about that. And uh, we'll move along before I start ranting, like I always do about that stuff. Okay, another big topic. Why Americans struggle with high gas prices. Americans drive over 14,000 miles a year on average, more than residents of any other country, and double those in the United Kingdom. As auto dependence increased after the Second World War, we built sprawling subdivisions and skimped on transit funding. We also became vulnerable to swings in gas prices. This leads to stress on low-income families and businesses when gas prices go up. This was by Adam Gabbett at The Guardian, which is a British publication, which uh, I think I posted this at the Greater Greater Washington Post, and people were like, oh, the Brits don't talk to us about this stuff. But I think Adam's in uh, Pennsylvania or something. So, you know, their writers can be anywhere. Now, they, they might write for The Guardian, but they don't necessarily live in England. But uh, this goes back to an argument I've made a couple of times on the show recently. We've had multiple off-ramps uh, for being dependent on oil. The 70s oil crisis is one of them, which actually changed a lot of the way that European cities were doing things. We talked about this last time as well as a few times before that. And when we had Gabriel Esperdi on, we talked about that. The first and the second Gulf Wars could have been another good time to change trajectories, but they but they weren't. Uh, we continue to be allied with these petro states, uh, and why we do so is beyond me. And then there's the Great Recession. You know, there was this opportunity to change then too, but this inertia is is one hell of a drug. And uh, there's always a way out. Now we're talking about electric vehicles, 
but even that's not enough. The, the Arctic and Ar- Antarctic were 70 degrees hotter than normal this weekend, which feels super scary to me. Um, like we're getting to a point of no return on the climate. I hope it, that's not the case, but it doesn't, it doesn't really look great, especially with those types of, of temperatures in March. And, and not 70 degrees temperature, it's a 70 degree swing, which is a crazy, crazy thing. It's going to zero degrees, 10 degrees, which is still obviously below freezing and things uh, not necessarily going to melt. But uh, when it's usually negative 70 or <laughs> negative 60 uh, in those places at this time of year in March, uh, it just doesn't seem uh, like it's going to bode well for this summer and for the climate overall. And then there's also the stress on the families and individuals of this, these oil price shocks. Um, that's frustrating as well. And we knew there'd be a day when gas prices were going to skyrocket, whether through war or natural disaster or something else, but we keep on doing nothing and, and we can't seem to get out of our own way, which is also another frustrating thing. We'll talk about this a little bit more at the end of the of the show, because I've got another article that talks about our politics and, and a little bit of how we can't kind of get out of our own way. Okay, here's another thing. And this this episode, I think, is a little climate heavy, I think, because um, there's these really interesting pieces from all over the world uh, talking about uh, is- interesting subjects. This one, could mass urbanization be good for the climate? New research out of China shows that the mass urbanization of the country led by rural migration could be beneficial on the road to zero emissions. The move from villages has increased carbon capture as ecosystems that were left behind have been revitalized. Between 1995 and 2020, China's rural rural population has decreased by approximately 350 million people, just over the population of the United States. So I gave you that 330 million population number earlier. Um, 350 people, million people migrated in China from rural areas to cities. And apparently, uh, it makes sense uh, on a basic level. I mean, they, they left the country and they moved to cities. And people in cities consume less water resources. They aren't uh, doing subsistence farming like they were or clear cutting. And hypothetically, imagine moving the whole population of the United States from a rural to an urban situation uh, such that the ecosystem can repair itself. We learned so much about this over the last 50 years about restoration. And and, and so that this might, you know, the migration in China and the study that talked about that makes so much sense in terms of carbon capture from 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 people moving to urban areas and what, you know, the, the natural landscapes can do when they're left to their own devices, um, you know, it's kind of like with the, when the wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone, you know, the apex predator came back and then the herd animal numbers came down, which let more plants and grasses and trees grow. They were overgrazing. And before they were worried because uh, all of that overgrazing was leading to erosion and runoff. And now you have the apex predators back, you have reduced numbers of herd animals. And so it's actually like more more trees are growing and more uh, the, the ecosystem is rebuilding itself. And so you have this system that's actually, you know, it's it's actually all very connected uh, around around the world. And right now at the Amazon, for example, we're seeing this problem where there's so much farming and ranching from humans. And scientists say like, you know, about 17% of the rainforest has been cut back so far, which is an incredible amount of, 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 of space that has been taken from the Amazon. And if it gets to 25%, they're thinking that it could lead to a rapid die off in the ecosystem. So, you know, we're doing this to our, our ecosystems at our own peril. Um, but it's interesting to think about what could happen if, you know, because there are urbanizations uh, in large green spaces. We talked about wildlife corridors and restoration when we chatted with Billy Fleming about design with nature now uh, in Talking Headways 298. So, um, you know, wildlife corridors, those types of things. There's a lot we can do uh, to, you know, we don't all have to move back to cities, but there's a lot we can do to protect the ecosystems, to, you know, protect wildlife corridors and all those things. So, um, you know, I think that's really interesting. And, and this this interesting uh, study looks at, how, you know, what happens if so many people become, you know, urbanized. Um, it's really fascinating to hear about the carbon capture that's possible in the places that they left. And I think that that's just, just super fascinating. So part of our discussion about urbanism, about transportation, about cities, about ecosystems, they're all connected. And so sometimes we'll talk about these ideas related to climate or or to you know what happens in these ecosystems uh, around the world, and I think they're all connected. And I think it's important to talk about because if we are just talking about transportation policy, or if we're just talking about um, you know urban planning or housing or some you know the, the basic stuff we usually talk about all the time, I think that there's a lot of that we can miss, and I hope that comes through in the show and in the podcast on Thursdays as well, talking headways, because we want to talk about all kinds of different things that are interconnected, not just uh, singular topics, because we are we are you know all interconnected with everything. Okay, next up. Fire insurance will have to change with the climate. Uh, the old ways of fire insurance are not working out positively for insurance companies on the wild 
land urban interface. A couple of fires in California over the last couple of years wiped out at 26 years of profit from one company and threatens to leave many without insurance. New approaches such as community insurance are coming forward, but ultimately there's still a big risk building closer to nature. That's Emma Morris at The Atlantic, another Atlantic article, which is uh, interesting. They had a couple that we've chatted about so far. Um, Again, I don't have much to say about this one other than the insurance industry right now um, might be the one that's going to pull the plug on building, building at the wildland urban interface. Right now, California makes sure everyone can get coverage, but at what point do those losses just become so big and so huge that it's just not a business model that makes sense anymore and perhaps doesn't protect anyone uh, from losing their, their houses. So at some point, I think they might you know, only allow for existing housing stock um, to be covered because you know, they don't want anything new to be built that, that they'd have to cover because it's likely that that will be lost in a fire. Um, and the ideas that they come up with in this article uh, in The Atlantic are interesting too. I mean, community insurance, basically. I mean, I mean, I know insurance generally is community because you're pooling resources, but thinking about it from not just like individuals and individual property owners buying into the insurance, but you know, a district or a community as a whole buying into insurance and you're paying into that. And then you have certain rules that you have to follow. So like building codes or hardening systems or brush clearance rules and regulations and things like that. Um, you know, that that's, that's a thing where, you know, you have to make sure you have, you know, five to 10 feet of clearance out, you know, around your, around your house. If you have something in the wildland urban interface, you have to make sure that your, you know, your, the fuel is not there so that the fire can't burn, uh, if it gets close to the house, et cetera, et cetera. So that, you know, type of thing, if you think about it from a community perspective, rather than just the individual house, it might actually be, be more beneficial, but at the same time, these insurance companies are having trouble keeping up and, uh, you know, pg e um, there's still the, the, the risk of fires from power lines and stuff like that. I know they're bur- burying them over the next, you know, several decades or so, but, um, every summer of this last five, six years, uh, has been, you know, f- more frustrating than the last because of the fires that have been happening in California. And it seems to be continuing to get worse, even though, uh, it used to be that, you know, you didn't have to worry about fire season necessarily. It's just, uh, summer, <laughs> but now it's something you really have to to worry about. I really hope we can find a solution that works for everybody. We need more housing in cities so that there's less people in danger on the fringe. Um, you know, if people wish to live there, perhaps they can, but we can't force people, th- you know, out there from the city because they don't have a place to live. I think that's part of the problem now is that the city, wherever the city may be in California. Sacramento, San Francisco, uh, cities in the Central Valley, uh, cities on the coast, is they're becoming so expensive that you're pushing people to go and find places that are cheaper. And a lot of the pl- cheaper places are going to be on that wildland I- urban interface on the edge of the of the forest where it's more likely that they can burn. So it's, you know, some people want to live there because it's nice and I understand that and they, they should be able to do that. But I don't think we should be forcing people there because we can't um, let them live in cities where they might have chosen first so that they can go visit on the weekends and then come back. Um, I think that's, that's, that's a distinction we should probably be making is that we can't force people out of cities. Okay. And I guess I'm talking fast today because this is my last article. Um, how road pricing is upending politics to pay for a 160 billion transportation plan that addressed the climate. San Diego, California regional planners set their sights on a road usage charge. Now local Republicans in the suburb of La Mesa and elsewhere are seizing opposition to road pricing as the way to win votes, hoping people will vote their pocketbooks over the climate. Um, so there's a piece, I want to read this like section of the article, this by, this by Justin Worland in Time Magazine. I thought this was a really good kind of encapsulation of the, the back and forth between choosing between kind of the, the want to have low gas prices and, and the want to not pay for road usage charge and to keep the, you know, keep inflation low and all that stuff versus the need to kind of get away from a gas tax, to get away from funding transportation at the policy level uh, through the usual ways and going towards this road user charge. Um, so here's here's a kind of a quote from the article that I think is really interesting. As energy prices rise at the same time that many governments are finally getting serious about climate change, lawmakers are facing an inescapable dilemma. Effective climate policy requires raising the price of fossil fuels and by extension, the price of high carbon products and services. But raising prices is deeply unpopular with voters, especially when energy costs are already high and especially during periods of rapid inflation. So I know this is very unpopular <laughs> opinion, which is why I won't be running for office. 
Uh, but we have a climate crisis happening. We have a war happening. We're too dependent on despots and, and criminals in our addiction to oil. But we've built ourselves into a corner. And like the first article, we discussed the choices we need to make in order to save ourselves from price fluctuations. And, you know, they aren't popular, but they will work. It's it's super frustrating to to have this discussion every single, you know, basically every decade or so where in the 1990, you have the, the Gulf War and in 2000, you have uh, the second Gulf War and the war in Afghanistan. Uh, at the end of the at the end of 20, you know, 2010, 20, 2009, we have the Great Recession. In the 70s, we had uh, the, the oil crisis. We have all these off ramps where we could have chosen a different path and we, we ended up not doing it. Um, I think that's inertia. I think it's folks, you know, kind of like the lifestyles that have been uh, created with with automobiles. And that's that's it is kind of what it is. I mean, people have been gotten, you know, have gotten used to this driving around uh, and and kind of the sprawling subdivisions. And part of that is because we kept growing out because people didn't want other people to live near them. And so you see this difference between here and other places around the world and what uh, other folks in, say, like Europe or, 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 or Asia are doing. And it's really interesting to see how much more we're driving, how much more we've kind of invested in the system that makes us vulnerable to the shocks in oil prices. And it's frustrating that we kind of can't control our own destiny. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're in deep with, um, you know, with folks in Saudi Arabia and things like that, that we really shouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, allied with in any way because of their actions and, and, you know, what it means to pull so much oil out of the, out of the ground and burn so many fossil fuels because ultimately, you know, it's the planet. So, uh, I'm sure we'll just continue this discussion in the future. We always do. But uh, I think those two things are connected. The the first piece uh, about, uh, you know, the oil shocks and, and how that creates issues for folks. And then also, um, you know, how this, this, this forward thinking idea about road pricing in San Diego has kind of led to a backlash and what that means for uh, politics of climate change, the politics of transportation overall. I mean, the, the, the frustration that that happened because of the infrastructure bill and the the fix it first community trying to get kind of guarantees that we're going to fix roads and bridges first and then now we're giving money away to states who are just going to end up using it for expansion and then not fixing their you know the roads that need to be fixed and then they're going to come back asking for more tax money and that's frustrating too so as we as i said we're going to have this discussion in the future we always do uh, and <laughs> it's going to be a fun one i'm sure and hopefully uh, in the future, we'll get uh, we'll get Chrissy and, and uh, Tracy and others to weigh on it as well. Um, I just need to get my act together sometimes to 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 you know get the show organized and and together to have guests and stuff. So apologize for that, but hopefully you get some some inf- interesting information out of me anyways because of the news we're sharing. Uh, thanks for listening. Okay, this week and every week, I want to thank our generous Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome and keep the show going by listening and supporting each month. This show and Talking Headways really wouldn't be here without it, so thank you very much. And you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. We've had people sign up each month during the pandemic, so we're super appreciative of that. $2 a month and you'll get some stickers, and a $10 a month and you'll get a bus-only scarf. The bus-only scarf is only available through Patreon. So um, like I said, I'm, I'm working on, on figuring out how to get some more scarves. I'm going to make a new design. I've also got some t-shirt ideas that I'm, I'm rumbling around with an artist on. Um, so that, that stuff should be hopefully soon. And, uh, we're excited to do that and, uh, got some good ideas. I hope, I hope you guys like them. I'm, I won't share them yet, but, uh, I've got some good ideas. So I'm looking forward to sharing those with you. Uh, also I want to mention, we did produce an audiobook version of Raymond Unwin's 1909 classic time planning and practice. If you want to get your hands on one, go to RaymondUnwin.com. Uh, the book was super fun to produce. And again, if you're a history of planning fan, it's the first one listed on the American Planning Association's 100 Essential Books of Planning. Check it out if you get a chance, uh, RaymondUnwin.com. And uh, okay, listener questions and comments. If you have a comment or question, feel free to tweet at us or comment on any social site where the podcast appears. Email me at theoverheadwire at gmail.com. Appreciate it, folks that are that were uh, you know mentioning us. Uh, for the book raffle for Peter Norton's uh, Autonorama. So we have that going on too. Make sure that you tweet at the Overhead Wire or post on the social sites uh, that you like the show. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to, to figure that one out and before next time so I, can, so I can make sure that we get the book into the right hands. Okay, puppies and butterflies. This is the part of the show where we didn't talk, we talk about something fun, interesting, or maybe just didn't fit in the other sections. Um, so I guess for me, I've been watching the NCAA tournament 
Uh, how about those peacocks? <laughs> That's, I love watching the lower seeds beat the beat the larger seeds, especially when somebody beats Kentucky. That's always fun. I'm kind of bummed for my my Longhorn men. Uh, they're out of the tournament, uh, but we did win our first NCAA indoor track championship a couple weekends ago. So that that's the kind of results that I'm excited about from the University of Texas when when my alma mater and my teammates uh, do really well. That's that's really happy. It makes me really happy. So, um, and as for shows we're watching, uh, we watch the Paralympics a bit. Those are really cool. You know, I, I enjoy the cross country skiing uh, and those types of things for the Olympics, but then also the Paralympics. We we try to watch those too because there's there's a lot of really good stories and people who've done a lot of work uh, trying to get back and get in shape and even though they've got a disability they're 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 really really good athletes and it's it's fun to watch them race against the best in the world and and it's fun to watch you know the the athletes uh, from around the world that are that are good at their sport it's just really cool and uh what else have we been doing um if you have any good ideas about things to watch uh comedies we you know Nancy and I watch comedies all the time um that's kind of where we keep our our interest comedies uh food shows on Food Network and then um, things on <laughs> things on the HGTV. We'll watch a lot of those shows too, but usually comedies. I'm, I try to stay away from the serious stuff and don't do any of that, um, mostly because it's like, you know, there's a lot of serious stuff going on in the world and I read news all day and it's sad, depressing, and I try to stay away from even the local news, uh, although we watch the weather. So, you know, got to get that funny in if you can. Uh, let me know at the overheadwire at gmail.com. So, uh, yeah, thanks for listening. As always, you all can find me at uh, the overhead wire on Twitter or at theoverheadwire.com. Thanks for joining us on Mondays at the overhead wire. Thanks to our generous patrons for sponsoring the podcast. We really appreciate it. And hopefully, uh, we'll see you next time with some more awesome news and information. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Talk.